everybody. Happy January 1st, 2021. Raj, we're recording this in 2020, but in this brief moment, we can pretend that 2020 is done. It is a brand new year, Raj. Thank God. We're going to make this one the best year of our lives. I'm feeling it, Raj. Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot to look forward to this year. Um, oh, yeah. So, I mean, talk about ending the year on a turd. Um, you know, it was it was a rough one with everything that happened this past week, but uh you know, we're looking now at the, in my opinion, the best Royal Rumble of all time. We're in Royal Rumble season. You know, it's one of the funnest times of the year, the Royal Rumble to WrestleMania stretch. So let's let's get it going. Yeah, dude. Everybody's gonna be on their best behavior in 2021. We're just gonna we're all gonna be able to leave our houses again. And you know, now before we get all to that, like you said, we're gonna look at Royal Rumble 1992. Now I am wearing my Ric Flair shirt here today. Because he's going to be a big part of what we're going to be talking about today. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. So, yeah, would, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, probably the most memorable Ric Flair night in WWF history outside of maybe his retirement. Oh, of course, dude. Yeah. I mean, watching this thing back, and, you know, we'll get into all the details of it here in a second. But I was like, man, how are there not more like Ric Flair moments? Like the right. man's WrestleMania career really didn't kick in until he came back. This guy shined like such a big star here at Royal Rumble 92. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, the the Flair Savage match at WrestleMania Eight kind of was second fiddle to Hogan versus Sid. Yeah, dude. But it was great. Like they still had a hell of a match. I thought it was the best. You know, as far as the match goes, uh, the best thing on the card. Uh, you know, Flair with that storyline with Elizabeth. I thought I thought it was great. It just kind of got overshadowed a bit. Yeah. Well, uh, here we go. January 19th, 1992. We are coming to you from the Knickerbocker Arena in Albany, New York. And uh, I had a, a bit of news here. So like we do, we have news here. So I went back to the Observer, which has been around almost as long as us. I'm not really sure who's older at this point. Um, but they, I'm, I'm definitely older, but you're, you're, you're a lot younger than I am. No, I'm saying, I don't know which is older, the Observer or, or Wrestling Inc. I don't know at this point. Oh yeah. It's, it's Wrestling Inc. was 97 when we got the domain. So it's got me, it's got us by a few years. Okay. Just a few though. Okay. Well, anyway, yeah. the Observer in 92, they're reporting that this was the first major pay-per-view show, uh, well after the anabol anabolic steroid testing had been supposedly implemented. So there were a few things to note first. The use appeared to have increased since Survivors and Texas, Tuesday in Texas. Yeah, dude, people on this show were gigantic. Uh, what are your recollections here of uh, this period and, and following the steroid trial and everything? Was this something that you even thought about when you were watching this show back? Did it bring back any memories to you? Uh, no, I mean, as a kid, I was a, you know, a teenager when watching this, and I was just assuming these guys, the guys that were on it, were off of it. And, uh, and you know, I mean... The guys on this show were humongous, but shortly after is when you started seeing all the departures. You know, Road Warriors was gone, were gone for a bit. Jimmy, you know, uh, the Ultimate Warrior, he came back. He was a lot smaller. Um, so you really started to see the changes. And by the next Royal Rumble, the Royal Rumble 93, I mean, the, the, the change was significant, like hugely significant. It was way different. It was night and day. So yeah, yeah. and in a lot of ways, especially considering all the talent was on the show, I think it's like eighteen of the thirty guys in the Rumble. Right. Kind of a culmination of that era before the next era would kick off. In a lot of ways, you think that's true? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, and this was where WWE really started getting super cartoony with their new characters. You had Repo Man, and you know characters like that, Skinner. So you're kind of seeing the old guard, which were these larger than life, but um, more relatable characters to just super cartoony. It was, it was kind of like they were going from He-Man to the Archies. Sure. <laughs> you know, and uh, and it was when you started seeing the beginning of that, the bad gimmick era where we had, th you know, a few years of the TL Hoppers and all these ridiculous gimmicks, Duke the Dumpster Gro Drossy and um, the Goon. The goon, yeah, uh, T.L. Hopper, yes. uh, the Phineas Godwin and the Godwins, and you know, <laughs> when it was just they were running amok with these over-the-top, you know, occupational characters, which just it was a, it was kind of a dark period for the company as far as their popularity and everything. And this was kind of the the zenith. This uh, Rumble '92, uh, WrestleMania eight before they really slipped down, and then obviously came back in the Stone Cold era. All right. Well, I'm going to skip over all these words here from the Observer. I mean, it just sounds like, yes, according to basically what he's saying with the steroid stuff is like 
we've run our cycle here. We're going to figure out if this is going to change or not. But anyway, it's not really important to your enjoyment of the show. That's just something. Right. And then with the steroid thing, they also did have a chance to, if they tested positive for steroids to bring their levels down, they weren't instantly fired at first. Right. So, you know, it's very possible a lot of these guys failed tests that, you know, ended up um, having their testosterone lowered. Uh, who knows? But a lot of these guys were gone by the following year. Okay. Well, there you go. Well, we've got here tonight uh, two of my favorite commentators, Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby the Brain Heenan. Dude, that is, I mean, this is already a very positive nostalgia show, but like you put their voices on top of this thing, man. This is like, it gave me the warm fuzzies watching this thing all the way through, hearing both these guys on commentary. They made it completely watchable. And there was some bad stuff on this show. Yes. Uh, the Bushwhackers. <laughs> that match went forever. Uh, but man, Heenan and Gorilla, they just made it so entertaining. And I, I think this will go down as the greatest performance by a wrestling commentator ever with Bobby Heenan. Because keeping up that frenetic pace for so long and then that worry and that fret and then also being you know, uh, jubilated whenever Flair was doing well and, and just keeping that up the whole entire card never came across as um, acting like he genuinely seemed concerned. Yeah. And, you know, he was just fantastic. Well, and again, these guys, you know, I don't think at this point Vince is in their ear, probably yelling at them all the time. You know, you got the vibe that Monsoon and, and Heenan were just kind of riffing off of each other. It was just very yeah. natural chemistry. I talk on the daily all the time. I call it the fun factor. Raj, when you can tell that the people you're watching are actually having fun, right? It kind of factors into their performance. Yeah. We don't get to see a lot of that. I don't. I don't feel. I don't feel Corey Graves and Michael Cole have that genuine kind of chemistry that we right. guys like this, you know. And, and a lot of their lines sound rehearsed. And you know, who knows? Bobby Heenan may have been saving a lot of these lines, but some of his lines were just so great and in the heat of the moment, where it just he was just so great at ad libbing at those one liners. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, like when Flair gave Undertaker a low blow, he's like he's trying to lift the Undertaker up, and yes. you know, just stuff like that it was so so awesome. So we go to the opening here before we even get to match number one, and in it, dude, this is the iconic Royal Rumble entrance. You got Vince McMahon reading all the names, gets to elect Ric Flair. He says, "Alleged World Champion," really sets the tone right. for the night. I thought the Undertaker, and then he ends it by saying, "It's time to rumble. It's time for the Royal." rumble uh just like this is i i saw this i felt like i was back at the arcade man this is like the same intro they used at the, i think this was the basis for the royal rumble arcade game wasn't it yeah i remember that yeah yeah that it probably was I, and i love this theme like uh, this was one of my favorite pay-per-view themes that they did this like SummerSlam that year um and, and like wrestlemania 6 like they had some really cool custom themes now they just you know they use songs that are already out there and uh, licensed music. But back when they created their own themes, I, I, and this was one just, I just loved. It was an, in the opening with Vince doing the voice, voice, the voiceovers. Um, Vince just had that voice that got you into it and just got you excited, you know? Totally. And another thing that I liked here too is they cut from that to Monsoon and Heenan. They're standing on this platform with the crowd behind them as they yeah. run down the crowd. And I just loved that they kind of moved the commentators around. It's like a little thing. Right. And, you know, they've played with putting the commentators in different places, you know, in the past of WWE. And I know it's not easy to do right now because there's no real fans, but I just thought it was a nice little accent. I, I miss kind of yeah. seeing that backdrop and being able to see all the fans and stuff behind the commentators. Yeah, I wish with Ron SmackDown, they'd experiment with that more. Like having not having the show look exactly the same, but one is blue and one is red. And granted, obviously, right now with the Thunderdome, you don't have that much flexibility, but when they go back to having fans experiment with having the commentators in different places for raw than SmackDown, just give the look, you know, a different feel and, and, and really make them feel like separate brands. Because I feel like when they do this raw versus SmackDown stuff, nobody really sees them as a separate brand. Like they do in NXT or an AEW, obviously those are completely different from on SmackDown. I'm starting to feel like Raw and SmackDown are different shows, Raj. Like I'm, I'm, no. I'm you know, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, maybe, maybe a little healthy confidence, maybe Raw getting a firecracker in his butt right now would not be the worst thing in the world. It is as we, as we reflect here on 2020, I think it is one of the biggest take. It's gotta be a top three story of the year was just how creatively divert, like the diverge paths that Raw mm -hmm. and SmackDown took creatively in 2020. Oh my God. I, yeah. I can wa I can watch Smack. I enjoy SmackDown. I yeah. What are they doing over on Raw, man? I don't know. 
it, yeah, it's 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 a pretty big difference quality wise right now. And you know, SmackDown they have their weeks where they're not great, but even the weeks where they're not great, they're way easier to watch than Raw. Obviously, the two hours versus threes helps, but Roman's been great. Uh, Sasha and and Bailey and Bianca, I, I think they, they just have so much great stuff going on on SmackDown right now. Oh, insane! Anyway, this isn't about that. Neither yeah. were there. So we get back. We get back to Rumble '92, match number one: uh, the Orient Express with Mister Fuji taking on the new foundation of Jim the Anvil Nightheart and the Rocket Owen Hart. Man, this was so great right out of the gate. Howard Finkel, he's announcing he looked great. All I wrote here was, who in the blue hell told Owen and Jim to dress like hip-hop genies? That's like, I know people aren't watching this, but like that's the best way I could think to describe what, uh, what Owen uh, and uh, Jim are dressed like here. I think, yeah, Heenan said something like, did Nightheart and Owen just find find out about this match? Because they look like they just got out of bed. Yeah, they look like they're in their pajamas, I think is what I remember. Yeah, and this is what I was talking about when they're starting to transition to that really cartoony uh, era with the new characters coming in or the, the new gimmicks that they're doing. Because I was a huge fan of this team. Like, I thought, you change your outfits and they automatically have, you know, some uh, credibility just being who they are. You can see how Owen can move. Anvil's, you know, already well established. And they were so fun to watch, but those outfits were just, they just took away from them. Oh, totally, man. And like the thing about Owen, too, and like you talk about how they st- got cartoonied, man. Like Owen, you know, and of course it's always talked about, but man, you watch him and that guy could go in the ring. He moved, oh, yeah. and, you know, and I think that's really, and, and people have talked about this. I think you talk about the dark side of the ring. Where it's like if Owen had just been around for like even two, three more years, you think about how there would have been more people that could wrestle his style. He was he was kind of a right. Malenko type in some ways, trapped in this WWE cartoon bubble. Because yeah, one of the first things I wrote down here, he did this the twisting arm stop that Shayna Baszler does right now that everybody loves. It looks brutal and stuff, but it's just right. weird in this cartoon world watching him actually do real wrestling and trying to hurt people. You know? Yeah. No, and Owen looked great. Everything looked smooth. I mean, he was just such a natural. And, you know, we're a a year away from him, you know, a year and a half away from him turning heel and really finding himself and getting rid of the ridiculous outfits and kind of becoming more more a serious character. Yeah, well... Even though he was hilarious. Yeah, no, for sure. And I wrote down here, you know, watching uh, Jim plant Tanaka with a slam. Uh, Then Cato finally got in. He was quickly cut off by Anvil. Owen took them both out with a crossbody off the top. Owen gets pulled to the side of the ring by Cato while Anvil uh, protested with the ref. Uh, Fuji popped Owen with a cane to turn the tides of the match. Tanaka shot Owen into the corner. Owen goes chest first into that thing as hard as he can, and Monsoon claimed that the ring moved four inches when uh, Owen hit that uh, that qu- turnbuckle there in the corner. Um, I wrote Owen was struggling, tagged in Anvil as the ref was distracted. Uh, Anvil charged in while the ref dealt with Owen to get blasted with uh, blasted with a Fuji cane shot. I wrote here just great tag work, and they were just getting heat. That was the one thing I noticed here. It was real simple stuff with Mr. Fuji on the outside inter, uh, interfering and just trying to keep uh, Owen in the match and, and them away from Anvil. It was it was just, I don't know, like it was too simple. We don't we don't see this kind of wrestling right now in modern uh, in modern time. Yeah, absolutely. And the Orient Express, they were kind of a really underrated tag team because they oh, had some absolutely. great matches with the Rockers. I mean, they could really go with teams like that, the Hart Foundation, now the New Foundation. Um, the finisher, I always thought looked a little weird with Anvil, you know, him jumping off of Anvil's shoulders. It seems like it's more de- devastating to, to go off the top rope. Well, it was, a, it was a fun, real fun opener. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. We don't need to go through the play by play here. Yeah. Just a fan. I just wrote, it was a real fantastic, fun match. I wish more matches today use the simple kind of techniques that they had here to get that heat. You know, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, with is maybe just because Vince over time has kind of refined it to a, a 10, 12 move style that he really feels comfortable with. But the way these guys were just freely kind of taking moments, distracting the ref, working with the manager again, that fun factor, that organicness. I just really enjoyed that watching these four guys work together. I thought it was a really good opener. Very yeah. Happy. And that cane shot that Owen took in, in the corner, you know, back then they didn't really have props. Like when they were hitting with guitars, they were hitting with real guitars. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that was probably a real cane. <laughs> oh, yeah. Probably, probably blasted it pretty hard there. Uh, yeah. So there we go backstage. Lord Halford Hayes recaps how Bret Hart lost the IC title to the Mountie at a Springfield house show two days ago. So uh, some kind of injury. Bret, what, what happened here? Do you know the story behind this? So in reality, this was planned ahead of time 
And what and Brett was actually talking about to WCW about jumping ship. That's and right. he was yes, he was really close to leaving for WCW. And then there was something in his contract where it actually wasn't up till later that year, and he ended up staying. But yeah, the plan was for Brett had been at that point planning to go to WCW. Okay, well, Hayes, uh, Alfred, Lord Alfred Hayes, who, you know, is just so great. Uh, he noted that Brett had a high fever, so that's what they were saying right. at the time. So Mountie beat on Brett with the belt uh, until Piper came out, and Mountie acted like he was going to leave before attacking Piper. And so him and Piper, they're at odds. Piper's going to get the IC title shot here tonight. So then we this go back. A, yeah, This was a huge deal back in the day, because I think that's the first time since I'd been a fan that one of the singles titles had changed hands at a, at a house show, like yeah, not on... Diesel beat Bob Backland like what a year or so later? Yeah, that was ninety five. So this okay. was ninety two, right? Was it ninety five or ninety four? Maybe it was ninety four. Yeah, it was early. Yeah, it was earlier yeah. than I think. Um, but then it's also kind of one of the first time. I mean, not maybe the first time, but it's like you see stuff like this, and you kind of have to be a smarter fan to kind of know, I guess, what happened here to understand it. Right. And not, and it wasn't as easy to be a smart fan in ninety two as it kind of is now. And obviously, everything's just you know there for you. Right. right. Yeah. No, th that stuff about uh, Brett going to WCW. I read that in the Observer later, like years later, um, because I, I didn't know what the Observer was back then. You know, right. I had Pro Wrestling Illustrated and that came out like months after the event would air. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, back then I remember thinking that Brett must legitimately be injured or something happened. Yeah. Uh, well, then we went backstage again to Sean Mooney. Uh, he was with the IC champion, the Mountie, and Jimmy Hart. Jimmy joked about Brett being sick and at the General Hospital, which was, a so I guess, soap opera was very popular in 92. Yeah. 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 Anyway. <laughs> uh, Mountie questioned Piper's win-loss record, said he, shouldn't w said he should win this match by forfeit, forfeit, and then the Mountie said he always gets his man. And it had been years, and, you know, it'll come up again here in a little bit, it's been years since I seen that shocker he had. That is like it's not even a real convincing looking shocker thing. Like, what was that thing that he has holding in his hand there? No, it was just a stick. And then someone would be on the the mic going. Zzz, zzz, zzz. So it was. I mean, that's that's what it was. And and when you when you listen to it now, I mean, you can tell it's a human being doing those sounds, and it's just it's really bad. Yeah, God, yeah. But they would do it over the PA, so it wasn't like dubbed in on you know on the the home feed. Like when I when I'd go to house shows, they would dub that, you know, they'd have someone on the, the PA doing that sound. <laughs> it was it was really bad. So. So, yeah. So then we went over to Okerland. He's talking to Piper. Piper called the Mountie one of the village people. He also said that he had no integrity, that he himself, Piper, had no integrity. That's why he's gotten so far. He also said that the Mountie has been dreaming and it's probably wet, too, which is like a, a sex joke of, of sorts. I wrote, I just wrote this made this was good but almost made no sense at like what was Piper he was in another world man these were just words I don't know that they were insults I don't know what was going on in this promo Piper felt like he was starting to lose it a bit here <laughs> like his promos were making less and less sense like you know his his promos back when he was feuding with Hogan and and uh when he was a heel uh, they made sense I mean he was he was off his rocker but they all made sense now he's just going all over the place i mean i still love piper but uh, at that time it, but it was just it was just crazy yeah yeah man like I, i'll put this one up against the steiner math promo you know like, <laughs> yeah. this this one was just wild well this brought us to ic champion the mountie with jimmy hart versus rowdy roddy piper uh first thing i write here man piper gets a hero's welcome lots of rowdy chants I've never seen him in this good a shape, man. He's in incredible shape here in 92. Really, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Piper was, um, yeah, he was pretty ripped at this point. He and was. uh yeah. And this match, I mean, it, there's, I remember when Piper passed away and he, because Piper was one of my favorite wrestlers growing up. There's like him, Savage, Hogan for a while. And uh, with Piper, it was never about the matches because I can count maybe like two matches that I thought were actually good. Like, like really good that you want to watch bell to bell over and over. And one of them was with Brett coming up at WrestleMania eight. Right. But he just had that, he, that char charisma and that character that the matches were fun. Like this match with the Mountie, it was fun. It, it wasn't a five-star thing or, or anything like that. Nope. Not a bunch of kickouts at two, but it was fun. 
Yeah, well, yeah, like, you know, threw the kilt in the face. You know, I, I wrote at one point here that Mountie threw Piper through the second rope, but Piper didn't go outside. Instead, he came back and he bit the Mountie in the head. I had forgotten how often Roddy Piper bites people, and it made me think, <laughs> like, why aren't more people going? Like, we saw Abaddon here, I guess, on Dynamite, kind of, and Shayna Baszler at one point did it, but just why aren't more people attacking via bite? It's so impressive, and I guess it, 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 there's no way you can be really hurting this other yeah, I mean, Shayna Baszler, when she did it to Becky Lynch last year, it was a pretty cool, cool effect. Yeah, but you don't need to, earlier this year. You don't need oh, to nice. rip like a chunk out of there. Just bite, you know, just fun bites yeah. to the head and things, you know? Yeah. Nobody's biting each other anymore. Uh, no. Well, anyway, yeah. So Jimmy Lane. Hart, he popped up on the apron. Mountie went to talk to him. Piper locked in the sleeper, middle of the ring. He gets the win. The win. And then afterwards, he takes the shock stick uh, from Jimmy Hart. And he shocks the unconscious Mountie. And then as you pointed out, there was somebody, I guess, I was wondering how the, the sound effect was made. There was somebody, I guess, actually making the bzzz yeah. when, he, when he zapped him. Yeah, Bruce Pritchard uh, talked about it on one of his podcasts. I think it was the Piper episode. How they, would have, they had someone on the PA just doing that sound. I, I, you know, I guess dumb, dumb me. I thought they had a sound effect. I didn't know they were so old school as to be doing, you know, Foley work, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it was uh, it was fun cheese, but yeah. yeah. And that's the thing is, so like, I liked the opening tag match. Really liked this match with Piper Mountie. Didn't go too long. A lot of fun, like you say. Piper's a great guy. We go backstage. Alfred Hayes. He's talking to Hulk Hogan in this Colise dude Coliseum home video exclusive. Yeah. Oh, dude, that that took me back to a very specific point in my life as soon as I heard those words uttered. Yeah. yeah, so I'd never seen this promo because I'd only I've only seen this wasn't on the pay per view. They inserted this for the the video release. So I was like, this is the most tame Hogan promo I've seen during a show uh, up until this point ever. Yeah, no, he was very he was very cool, man. He's just like, right. hey, come on in. Let's. I guess we're gonna do this thing. It was almost like I guess it would be like a WWE.com or like social media video is kind of what this was. Right. Um, I uh, didn't get to watch pay per views until much later for a lot of reasons. So I did grow up on tapes. And so like, I actually did remember this. And I yeah. was like, I remember the Coliseum home video cut-ins. Yeah, no, I used to, before I got paid, I think once WrestleMania four, that was the first pay-per-view a friend of mine had a satellite. So you'd tape it and then we'd watch it. So that was the first pay-per-view I ever saw. But WrestleMania, it was a Survivor Series 89, I want to say, or 90 was the first pay-per-view I got to actually buy where we lived because it was so hard to so hard to get but i remember we got this pay-per-view and i had to work that night and so i was so pissed i couldn't get out of it my dad he, he he watched it as it happened my dad was a big wrestling fan at the time and when he picked me up from work he's like you want to know what happened and i was like no no i want to watch it he's like something huge happened and <laughs> oh god man now you got to tell me so it was spoiled before i got to see it <laughs> oh, that's such a bummer um yeah. Well, yeah, so Hulk says he's coming for the title. Nice little setup. Then we went backstage again where Gene Okerlund, he's interviewing the Bushwhackers and Jameson ahead Ugh. of their match against the, the Beverly Brothers. Lots of yelling here. Um, I had totally, like, blanked the character of Jameson Ugh. out of my head. Like, I had yeah. forgotten this, this human being existed. Wow. I mean, I guess like Revenge of the Nerds was just really popular in like 92 at that point, right? That was like a late 80s movie. This was a complete ripoff of Revenge of the Nerds, right? No, I, th I thought they were ripping off Urkel. Is that what Like it was, it was their version of Urkel. Because Revenge of the Nerds was earlier in the 80s. So it could have been like a hybrid, but you know that Urkel kind of did the same thing. Had the suspenders and the glasses and over the top, you know, was over the top. Yeah. Well, Family I Mat Matters was pretty big at that point. Yeah, and kind of yeah, a little, little kind of like Eugene, right? Very sensitive soul. I'll put it that way. Kind of. I, I cannot stand this character. <laughs> no, dude, I'm, I'm like God. obsessed. I do. I'm not gonna lie. Of all the interviews that I'm probably gonna seek out here in 2021, can we get Jameson? Like he's got. I mean, like I, I would think he's still around, right? Uh, he, yeah, I mean, he was a comic that Vince McMahon just really liked. Like he saw his, uh, his stuff and and just was a big fan, so decided to uh, make him a character, but. Okay. I'm sure he's I'm sure he's out there. I'm going to go get him, Raj. Like, yeah. I'm going to go find Jameson and we're going to get to hear some Jameson stories. <laughs> you uh, know, one of the funner interviews I, I that we did, I can't remember if it was you or me, but it was uh, Sean Mooney. And 
I don't know. I think it was me. Okay. Yeah, it was me. Okay. Um, uh, it was like a year and a half ago, two years, maybe it was, two, maybe it was right before you, you joined on, but some of the stories from that era are just so crazy because Vince was, you know, he was still progressive. He wasn't just keeping the show as it was, you know, he was just all over the place trying to change the product, trying, trying to change it, trying to change the look you know, trying a bunch of different things. And just some of the stories from back then are wild. Yeah. Or Jameson's has some. Oh, man, I want to get Jameson. Like, <laughs> there are people I watched on this show where I'm like, I can get this person. Like, yeah. you know, that happens when I watched all these retro shows. So this brings us to the Beverly Brothers with Lanny Poffo, the genius, versus the Bushwhackers with Jameson. What what a six what a system we've got here. Genius cuts a pre-match promo poem promo i mean you know what a poet and uh yeah then the bushwhackers came out and everyone in the arena i mean like the the goddamn beatles raj yeah. doing this bushwhackers thing you know yeah. it was crazy how over yeah. this thing was no it was, i mean anytime i went to house shows and they were on everyone in the stands they would go crazy for them Licking a child's face, which is you weird can, now. You can't do that now. No, you can't. Not even, not even pre before COVID. You can't be licking kids' faces. I, I will say this. Monsoon and Heenan, they're having fun with this. You know, Monsoon, he said, Bushwhackers have legally adopted Jameson. I wrote, this is some of my play-by-play. -play. I wrote, Jameson is now eating a roll, like a, like a bread roll that he had in his pocket while the Bushwhackers lick each other's heads. That's where we were in 92. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and wasn't he like picking his nose? and? Dude, he used this dirty sock. I hear more play-by-play. -play. Dirty sock to blow his nose. Yeah. Um, there was a point where Genius grabbed Jameson and slapped him on the outside, which got some heat, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah, I always thought the Beverly Brothers, if they, again, if they weren't so gimmicky, they could have became something. Like, not had the, the big capes. And I, don't, I don't know what their gimmick was. They almost looked like circus performers. I thought the same thing. I was like, what are these guys? Right. You know, kind of maybe like L Lex Luger-esque. Remember Luger used to kind of do the, the narcissist. Dub dual narcissist. Yeah. Yeah. And Luger came later. Luger was the next year. Um, they tried it again. They yeah. were like, Vince is like, this gimmick's too good. You gotta have more <laughs> guys in capes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was because they, these guys worked really well and, and uh, they had a good look. And, but just that, that, that was costumes just brought them down. So anyway, the Bushwhackers finally win this thing after a long time, dude. This no, they lost, right? I thought the Beverly Luke, Brothers. Luke is upset. Ref is dealing with him while this is happening. The oh yeah, you're right. Beverly Brothers, not not Bushwhackers. Hit the right. top rope double axe handle for the win. Very lackluster. Yeah, and then the Bushwhacker Bushwhackers got their revenge at the end, and they had Jameson kick Jimmy Hart in the shin or something. I forgot this match happened. So I, I had rewatched the Rumble match itself, the, the 92 Rumble match when Bobby Heenan passed away, just because oh, yeah. that was one of my favorite Heenan moments. But I didn't watch the whole pay-per-view. So I don't think I've seen this pay-per-view in like 25 years. And whenever I did, I would skip the undercard. Like, so I, I don't think I've seen this match since the night it happened. Dude, it was such a letdown, man, because I really did like the first two bouts. You know, yeah. there's Owen Hart, oh, yeah. you got Roddy Piper, and then this thing, I, I, I wrote, this would have been good if it had been a third of the time. If it, it was 15 minutes. Dude, it was, what the hell were they thinking, man? It's like the whole the whole thing should be the Bushwhackers come out, there's a little runaround, Beverly mm -hmm. Brothers get the distraction, boom, you do the finish, and then the post-match stuff. <laughs> like, this went on way too long, yeah. way too long, you know? And I wonder if it's because Piper uh, Mountie went short. I wonder if they didn't go long enough. So. Yeah, that I mean, that was only five minutes. <laughs> so. That didn't make any sense. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, I don't know. We went backstage. Mean Gene is now with the WWE Tag Team Champions Legion of Doom, which look exactly like the action figures. Like they look like action figures come to life. Yeah. And Animal screamed a promo about how they're going to face all challengers, including the national disasters. And Hawk said the typhoon and earthquake make them sick and their tongues will be hanging from their mouths like dead deer, which made me think uh, Hawk had probably recently gone hunting. But yeah, no, I, you know, I, it's just cool to watch old LED, LOD promos, man. Always. Yeah. They, they hold up. Yeah. They were like, um, I mean, they were like the warrior where they could say nothing at all. And you're still just like enthralled. <laughs> you got, you get nothing from what they said, but it was just awesome. And uh, that's what I thought here. 
Yeah, not much to write home about here with this match between uh, the Natural Disasters and the uh, and the Legion of Doom. I mean, the crowd was 100% behind these guys, whatever was kind of, you know, and again, like we're watching this through a, a, a prism of like 20 plus years later. In the audience, I mean, maybe the Bushwhackers were so hot, they, did, they didn't burn out that crowd. Kind of sounded like to me, but man, as soon as LOD came out, they were right there, you know? Yeah. Hawk is in ridiculous shape zero body <laughs> right you know um and then yeah you know i i just said that the the natural disasters did a fantastic job using their weight in different ways to inflict damage these guys moved really well for some big man and i thought we're just you know for two big muscle dudes like lod they were the perfect foils here to kind of go back and forth with the weight versus the kind of power dynamic kind of yeah thing. and and this match was better than I expected. When I when they were coming to the ring, I was expecting it to be just, just you know, nothing to write home about. But I actually I actually liked it better than uh, than I was expecting. I always forget how uh, Earthquake was really good and Typhoon yeah. could move too. And this was when before the LOD uh, really got weighed down with all their their issues and, and uh, you know injuries and stuff like that. So the the finish was crap. So that that brought it down, but yeah, yeah, like that's the thing is, so we got everybody roll a uh, brawling outside the ring, and it gets to this double count out, and the natural disasters they take the belt, they act like they won, but of course they didn't because it's a double down da- double count out, and so L E L O D ran the natural disasters out of the ring with the chairs, and then they pose with the belt. So yeah, I mean, like it was a schmoz finish here, I'm guessing, just because there was more planned between these two teams beyond Royal Rumble '92, right? Yeah, you know, again, it wasn't like. It wasn't like a five star club, but I did enjoy the dynamic here again with like LOD having to muscle these big men around because LOD are huge in and of themselves. Finding something that's going to make them feel like they're going to have to fight is really difficult. I thought, yeah, the natural disasters did a good job of that here. Yeah, yeah, and within a within a couple months, the LOD kind of went away for a while. Like they, I think they lost the belts. Gosh, I want to say it was to the Natural Disasters as a house show. So it was another one of those house show title changes. And then they came back at WrestleMania eight with Paul Ellering and a, and a puppet. Oh, that's so. right. I remember the puppet LOD member. Yeah. Rocco. Rocco. Oh my goodness. That's yeah. a, that was that, that, that wasn't a Wembley, was it? No, no, that was at WrestleMania eight. And then they had their last match at Wembley. That's what I'm thinking of. Okay. Yeah. And their last match before they came back years later. Okay. Got it. Uh, well then we go to a series of backstage segments that we will roll through here before we get to the rumble. So man, this is all, it's just a a series of backstage segments. Uh, I wrote the natural disasters, literally scream words that I cannot understand at Sean Mooney. Jimmy Hart says they should be champs. He's getting a lawyer. (laughs) (laughs) So during this time they had a dark match playing. So I don't know if you said you didn't really watch the pay-per-views back then, but they would have an intermission like 15 minutes where they just have a counter on the screen counting down 15 minutes and so they changed that here to to be this where it's just a bunch of promos uh to the live audience they actually had a dark match and at the end jack tunney came out reversed the decision i think they wanted him to get a good reaction for later when he you know uh came out for the wwf championship to to proclaim the winner of the new champion so oh yeah who was the dark match do you know the dark match i don't want to say here let me look it up I'm gonna I, for for whatever reason I'm gonna say Coco Beware was involved. Feels like it was the Brooklyn Brawler. You were close. Uh, Chris Walker defeated the Brooklyn Brawler by disqualification. So the Brawler actually pinned Chris Walker at first. Jack Tunney came out, reversed it, and the match continued, and it was a, a DQ. Okay. All right. Well, Brawler, Coco, similar. Thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Then we go to Million Gene. He was with Roddy Piper, who was ranting about how only in America could a guy like him the IC champion. He also noted that he's going to make the other men in the rumble fall down like president Bush. And then he screamed, I have a dream and left. <laughs> That's so yeah, Bush, this was when he had, uh, he had gotten sick at like a, a dinner in China. Yeah, he puked <laughs> in the, the guy's lap, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I like, I had to think about it again, Roddy Piper, right? just anyway. yeah <laughs> he was he was nuts so this next segment here i thought was actually kind of cool because it's a real moment in time sean mooney is with sean, uh, sean michaels who he's calling an underdog and and they note that sean recently turned on marty Janetti at the barbershop they replay what happened uh man and i said marty i said sean just play plants marty with that super kick looking back on it 
Marty cannot compete in the Rumble due to what happened. And Sean says he's the hottest thing the WWF has ever laid eyes on. And I'm guessing like this interview segment here right now has got to be kind of like considered the coming out of Shawn yeah. Michaels. This was like the first time I can remember him looking and sounding like a big single star. This was really kind of cool to watch back. Yeah, he kind of instantaneously instantaneously just changed. Like he it wasn't like a slow he started changing his outfit a little bit. He was completely gone from the rockers to this new yeah. uh, get up. And yeah, he sounded like a star. It, it, this happened so soon before the rumble though. It was like the week before, right? Yeah. Or it aired the week before that. The crowd still they didn't really react when Sean came out. No. Like it was you know, I think if it had been a few more weeks, he could have, but ultimately it didn't matter. He it was, he was in the rumble and you know, he, he lasted a long time. Yeah. We'll get to the rumble here. There's some great stuff yeah. with Sean. I just thought it was so cool to see him in that moment. Uh, then we went to Lord Alfred Hayes. He's with Ric Flair for another Coliseum home video exclusive. Uh, he just, he just announces it. He says, I drew number three. Yeah. <laughs> I was never on the pay-per-view. I guess that's why he felt comfortable saying it because he knew the live crowd wasn't going to hear it. Yeah. No, uh, that, I mean, that kind of kill. Yeah, that kind of kills the surprise. But I guess if you're watching it on video, you already know. Um, And then he says he, he'll be in the match uh, nearly an hour, but he knows he's going to win. He's gonna <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So he just kind of called a shot there. Babe Ruth it. Um, <laughs> then we went to like a series of vignettes here mean gene uh he throws to macho so these are all individual kind of promo short promos macho okay. man i wrote forced words out of his mouth about the rumble he said he's going to go back to the top of the mountain and he wants to get his hands on the snake man who had been taunting him and elizabeth but elizabeth was no longer on the road at this point right yeah 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 so anyway crazy oh no she was uh because she became a big part of that wrestlemania 8 storyline i think she it was just I think when I was reading the Observer back, I think she was gone, but I think she came back. I think she wasn't on the road at this moment in time because I don't think she's on the show. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then they started using her for the angle, but yeah, she wasn't traveling to house shows and stuff, right? Yeah. Um, then Psycho Sid looked directly in the camera without blinking, and he told everyone to open their eyes because they were looking uh, at a man who is superior to all, and he is the size of a barn. He is terror. He kind of, like, it's Dexter Lumacy a little bit is what I thought when I looked at him. Yeah, he's it, it's hard to take your eyes off of this guy in this show. I mean, he is just he's intense. Um, he was a he was an ultra baby face head into the show, and then this promo, you get the glimpses of heel Sid, and man, he was awesome. Uh, Repo Man, speaking of awesome, uh, he was whispering, telling the fans to come in close so we could talk about how he loves to take things from people, and he teased that the world title would look great around his waist. Another character that I, I think we could get Repo Man too. Like, yeah, see, uh, Barry Darso, Smash. Smash? Oh, yeah, that is Barry Darso. Yeah, it? yeah. Oh. one of my favorite tag teams of all time. And I was like, they ruined him. <laughs> wow. I, so, wait, he was Demolition, then he became Repo Man? Yeah, yeah, when they broke Demolition up, he, they, they gave him that Repo Man character. Oh, dude. And, I, I, and they clearly had big mind. plans for it because he got two eliminations in this match. Dude. Oh, now I, I get Darso. That's fine. We'll grab him this year, too. <laughs> Just making a wish list as we watch the rumble. Uh, Bulldog, he noted the last time he was in the match like this, he won at Royal Hall. He was trying really hard to not garble his words with this thick accent, and it literally sounded like he had marbles in his mouth. It, 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 it's Pete Dunn syndrome. Like, mm -hmm. I, he sounds exactly like Pete Dunn, where it's just like they have to try so hard to even make sense. I don't know why they <laughs> speak English, you know? Yeah, and he got better as the years went on. Like, uh, he was still new to the singles uh, scene here, but uh, I thought his promos got better and better as, as he went along. Jake the Snake Roberts talking to promos, man. He starts off here with a Rolling Stones line. Uh, he says he doesn't always get what he wants, but he gets what he needs. And he says 29 men are going to disappoint tonight. And he tells uh, Randy Savage he's going to be waiting for him. Um, we interviewed Jake this year, and that was – I asked – we were talking about his promos because not yeah. even AEW – this was one of the first things he said. He's like, I just like to start with a reference. You know, he did the Hail Caesar thing with Cody. He's like, as soon as I say something that you are familiar with, now your mind starts thinking, like, what's this guy trying to do with all this subliminal messaging? That was all I thought when I saw this. I just thought it was a cool little throwaway here for Jake. Man, one of the great promos of all time, and in a way a little underrated because you have, people always think of Rock, Stone Cold, but Jake, man, he can really suck you in. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
yeah, I think a lot more people would, would benefit from kind of taking tips and learning his style. Well, we got a couple more. We got we got two more. No, we got three more people here in this little montage. Uh, Mr. Perfect is with Ric Flair. Uh, he says that R- Ric Flair quote rocks the cradle, which I don't I don't know why that just sounded wrong. I like wish he hadn't said it. Um, Rick cuts a Rick promo, yelling at the camera about how he's a real world champion, and he says he only lives one way, and that is under the belief that in order to be the man, you have to beat the man, and then he wooed. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> setting the tone. Um, we went to Paul Bearer with Undertaker. He says he's going to need 29 caskets. And then Taker says he's going to be crowned, uh, once more, the WWF champion. Uh, and then they cut to Hogan, who was glistening like a fish, uh, saying he's going to prove the power of Hulkamania. He put over the prestige of the Rumble and how the title on the line makes it more important. And then he tells the people at Titan Towers not to worry about Taker or Jake becoming the champion. And that was it, man. That was all the pomp and circumstance before we get to this big match here. Did you just, did you, I mean, that list you just read of the names in this rumble. Oh yeah. Hogan, Takers, Randy Savage, Roddy Piper, Ric Flair, Shawn Michaels. Uh, I know Kerry Von Erich was on the descent then, but you know, a legendary, legendary wrestler, Jake, the snake Roberts. I mean, good God, this rumble yeah. was loaded. Like, the most, uh, it, it's the most star studded match in, in the history of pro wrestling. Well, and it was paced well too, which is like, we're going to get into it here, but that's the thing that was also so great about this is like, they knew like whoever, I mean, I'm guessing it's, you know, Patterson and, and Vince that put right. it together, you know, it, this thing was just very well, it was a well-told story and like having the Ric Flair and the world title dangling over it, it mm-hmm. did, it makes us feel like such a bigger deal. And you could tell the fans live in attendance, they really cared right. very much into this, this whole time, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So we get to the Rumble match here, and uh, the Fink goes over the rules. He brings up President Jack Tunney, who has the world title, and Tunney takes the time uh, putting over the bout, and Heenan uh, rags on him, saying he's the best president since Noriega, which, uh, again, a 92 political reference right. that I had to scratch my head about and go do a Yeah, the, the Rocks the Cradle was also a, a 92 reference because the hand that rocks the cradle had just had come out. I know it's a movie reference, but it just, yeah. it's like, it doesn't, I don't know that it aged correctly. Right, right, yeah. Not, not badly, but not correctly. Right, like, a lot of the stuff doesn't. <laughs> so, anyway, first man out, Davey Boy Smith Jr., followed by the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase with Sherry. Uh, real quick, DiBiase's in control, first minute of show, tries to pitch Davey, who dodges behind his back, and then, eliminates DiBiase early. Ted DiBiase in and out. Davy Boy standing strong here. Um, as we get uh, the Nature Boy Ric Flair coming out. No music, which just feels weird, but I don't think they did music for anybody in this room. Yeah, no, no. They used to do just uh, just silence. So it was like you just hear the crowd reactions. And there was something kind of cool about it. Um, yeah. I don't know. It just, it was like with Andre, when Andre would come out with no music, there was just this aura and this... Uh, I don't know, just hearing the crowd reaction when they would come out as opposed to hearing the music. It was it was cool. Um, well, and, and Bill Apter would talk to me about this, you know, when he would go to the old MSG shows, you know, before obviously infamously like the Freebirds like introduced, you know, uh, theme songs and everything. But nobody had entrance music. And like the right. way Bill would describe wrestling shows, like they feel more like, I guess, MMA or boxing does now where you just see these guys coming through guarded by security and stuff. Like I, I kind of would love to see how that rawness, if I mean – if a company tried it, I guess I'd just be really interested to see how that played because it seems like it could be kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's one of those things I don't see changing back, but I, I don't think every wrestler needs entrance music. I think it might add, I don't know. I guess with the sets now, it's kind of hard to do, but because now they got the videos and stuff. So if you got the video playing, you probably need music with it, but yeah, yeah, I, 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 I kind of like this, not having the, the entrance music. Um, I mean, like you just, I mean, like thinking about Edge coming back at the Rumble earlier this year, like imagine if he had didn't, like you didn't hear the, and the first thing you just saw was Edge. Like I would be very interested to have seen right. and heard what that moment looked like, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, but on the flip side, you do get the huge pop as soon as people hear the music and figure out who it is before they even walk out. So I, I, I can see, I'd like to see them doing it once in a while, but <clears throat> Why not? We got the yeah. lessons night coming up here. We'll go old school. Yeah. Um, then, of course, yeah, Flair's out there. At one point, Rick uh, gracefully leapt uh, up for a crossbody on Davey, who gorilla pressed him, and he did several reps. And again, like, you don't see guys doing this today. I don't know if it was because, again, the steroid thing we, we talked about earlier or whatever. 
But man, Davy Ric Flair is not a small man, and he's just throwing this guy up and down with mm-hmm. biceps. I was yeah, no, this. Yeah, who I, there was someone who we um, we saw do it recently. Um, oh, Bianca Belair. Oh, she did. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that takes a ton of strength, and Bulldog was a beast. Dude, very impressive. Uh, then we had at number four, Nasty Boy Sags with Jimmy Hart. Sags uh, went after Davey, started to work with Rick. Davey double chokes or double clothesline them, pitched Sags after Sags attempted to not hit the ground. So now we're back down to Davey and Rick as, dude, uh, another like sleeper, let's just add him to the list uh, kind of guy. Haku, the father of the Gorillas of Destiny over in New Japan Pro Wrestling. And he came out and he went after Davey with these like amazing looking kicks and headbutts dude haku is awesome man that's all i have to say about this yeah kind of underrated and i thought wcw was really trying to trying to push that with his main character and uh they just never could they they could never transfer how much of a badass he was in real life to you know his wrestling character because he is uh, anyone from that era will tell you he's one of the toughest guys ever I can't. I mean, he's a guy that could get pulled into whatever they're doing with Roman and Jay and all the Usos and Anawahi family over on SmackDown right now. Pretty. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, well, anyway, Rick decided to powder go out the, underneath the bottom rope, and he's just like, "I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to sit out." The refs actually corralled him back into the ring, which I just wrote. I just thought it was it. It was it made sense, and nowadays the ref wouldn't even try. Right. <laughs> you know, they just yeah. like, whatever. You're gonna hide. You're gonna hide. You know. Right. Yeah. Um, more power for the refs. Uh, I just love that I said all three of these guys are just going around Rob, Rob, round Robin style, not trying to uh, like nobody's teaming up the site. That was another thing I noticed here in this match. The psychology that would evolve over Rumbles in the years to come is completely missing here. Nobody's really teaming up. Everybody's just kind of, and this is throughout the whole match, just kind of randomly going after everybody. Did you also notice this? Yeah, and I, I think this was. Like in the case of like Shawn Michaels, who who who's out who's out next? Yeah, uh, I think it was just a case of a lot of them wanting to do something with Flair, you know, yeah. like yeah, you know, because they know they're probably not going to get a singles match with him, and and uh, you know he's he was a legend already at that time, so yeah, because you could see it seemed like everyone went after Flair first. Oh, dude, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> number six here, Shawn comes out, crowds booing Shawn like crazy. I said, I am in awe of watching Sean and Rick immediately go after each other. They work great together. Even then, Davey went after Sean, pressed him a few times, gave Sean his first year elimination. But yes, this is a, I mean, as young, fresh Sean Michaels as you can get working with Flair and his prime. It, it, it's like in my head, I was watching this, but I was also seeing their like mania retirement match. Like side right. by side. I don't know if that was like for you, but I saw both those things side by side in my head. I was absolutely just watching that. There were a couple other moments in this match where it is just like, whoa, like the history of that moment, like when Flair and Kevin Von Eric, I mean, uh, Kerry Von Eric were going at it too. It was like, you know, just, you know, years earlier in Texas, Kerry Von Eric beat Rick Flair for the NWA title, oh, yeah. you know, in one in front of a large crowd in Texas. So, there, there were those moments in this match. Piper and Hogan were going at it briefly. Um, so yeah, yeah, just that's all I could think of when Sean and Flair started going at it was their WrestleMania retirement match. Well, out came then Tito Santana, and just like Sean, he went right after Flair. Uh, Sean went after Tito for some reason. Everything broke down. Ric Flair low blowed Davy. The whole crowd ooed like they felt it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I also wrote that Santana hit a flying forearm, which Heenan called the flying jalapeno and i had i i was getting jerry lawler uh ramen noodle senton vibes off that moment another thing i don't know age correctly oh yeah they don't age well but him and jesse ventura used to always have all and i think we talked to or someone talked to tito they did an interview with tito and tito was saying he loved it like he would talk to bobby and, and jesse uh but yeah that wouldn't that wouldn't fly i mean as we saw with lawler with the the ramen line. I think the hashtag flying jalapeno would not be doing well today. No. <laughs> um, number eight comes the barbarian. I wrote just barbarian is Mason Ryan levels of huge. <laughs> just a yeah. Gigantic individual that is into the match. Yeah. And he um, it's weird. He didn't really almost stand out because there were so many huge guys, you know? Dude, and that's why I was like earlier, I was like, natural disasters for LOD worked because like, who are you going to get that's bigger than LOD? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, then came, like you said, yeah, uh, Carrie Von Eric here, uh, Texas Tornado. 
went right after also went right after flair did a flare flop in the corner uh tornado hit michael so hard he did a corkscrew flop and i said it's like and at this point i realized i'm looking at sean and rick side by side i thought they were trying to outflop each other <laughs> I, th I thought sean was trying to like outdo rick when in the cell department here yeah did we have we ever seen ziggler and sean at the same time in a in a royal rumble match i don't think back I, in the day i don't i don't i don't think so man um I sean, yeah, yeah i think that might have been before ziggler's time or it was right there but I, I could see them kind of being the same thing where they're trying to outflop each other uh, during the rumble. Oh, dude, yeah. And like with the tornado here with Carrie, so like is is Carrie the one who was dealing with the the foot issue here? At the yeah. Time? And like W, man, that was rough for me to like watch him in the ring here, kind of knowing everything we learned from Dark Side of the Ring and everything like that. Yeah, he had an in the, it, his whole WWF run. He had that amputated foot. Oh my god! Um, I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell watching this match. I didn't know till years later. I, I was watching for it, Raj, and like yeah. I couldn't even tell. Yeah, same. So then we got number 10, Repo Man, slowly creeped to the ring, quickly creeped me out. <laughs> <laughs> it's clear that they had plans for Repo Man because you know how with the Rumble, you could always kind of tell who they're, they're kind of, they kind of have plans for. It's the guys that last a long time, the guys that get a lot of el eliminations, and then the guys that get no eliminations, you know that they don't really. And Repo Man had two eliminations. I mean, Randy Savage, who would go on to win the WWF Championship in just a couple months after this, he only had two. So, so didn't Repo Man feud with like Rick Rude here not long after this or something like that? A uh, Boss Man. Oh, Boss Man. Okay. And it kind of started here, and then they were in an eight man at WrestleMania eight. But yeah. okay. that gimmick was DOA. But Vince apparently saw some big things like with the the yin to the yang with the Boss Man. Okay, cool. Well, it's a, he's a weirdo. Him and Jameson can go, can go away to never see you again, Island. I will do interviews with you. Very dark. <laughs> Jameson. Uh, then at number 11, Greg the Hammer Valentine, who, like everyone else, immediately went after Ric Flair. Uh, yeah. They said the ring's filling up, a lot of brawling. Repo Man snuck up on Flair, punched him in the middle of the back. It looked brutal. So that's all I got for here right now. Yeah. Um, then at number 12, Nikolai Volkov, who uh, immediately went after Repo Man. Change of pace here. Yeah. Santana and Davey are just passing Michaels back and forth, punching him. Greg Valentine put the figure four on Flair, which I thought was a kind of like, again, we talk about the moments in this match. Right. Uh, I think that it was uh, like Flair got the four, figure four from Greg Valentine when he was like, Valentine like came out of the terror, something like that, left the territory and then took the move, something like that. I think Gerald Briscoe referenced this recently. Oh, did he? Yeah. Oh, I thought they both got. I thought didn't Buddy Rogers also use the figure four? And I thought they both got it from him. But Valentine yeah. might have been doing it before him. Maybe. I think, I think that's what it was. I think that yeah, Valentine was using it before Rick, and then after Valentine left the territory, Rick was there, and nobody was doing it. And I think that's when he picked it up, and they wound up both doing it. Huh. So, anyway, uh, and then Repo Man, yeah, like you said, first of his eliminations, he eliminated Volkov. Um, <laughs> then the Boss Man came out. Um, I said, I just wrote, I feel like these entrances are now coming quicker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they said back in the, back in those days, they would just do it whenever they felt like it. It's and, uh, felt like it. <laughs> yeah. um, I wrote, man, I, I am so bummed. I never got to meet and hang with Ray trailer. I have had some great conversations with Jim Duggan about Ray and dude, he can move. I just enjoyed watching him in here, push repo man out of the ring, which I think everybody liked. Flair's eliminating Davey. Flair eliminated the Tornado. Santana and Mike, Michael's eliminated each other. So a whole bunch of people get eliminated here. But yeah, back to Boss Man. I just wrote, this guy can really move. It was just a pleasure to watch him in this bout. Yeah, I was always shocked that WCW, when they got him after this big Boss Man run, they weren't able to do more with him. They just couldn't, they gave him like 50 gimmicks, a Guardian Angel and the Boss. And um, then he was just Ray Trailer. I mean, they could not... They could not come up with, with something for him. And he's a talented big dude. Well, and I watched Deadly Games 98 back with Weissman. And, like, Boss Man is, like, in nine segments on that. Like, right, yeah. And he's one of those guys who did successfully kind of transition and update his gimmick. Where, like, yeah. Boss Man in 98 is just an updated version of a police officer. And it totally works. He's still got the yeah. nightstick. It's all, it's, like, just a little different gear, you know? Right, yeah. Yeah, it was all, all black as opposed to the, the light blue. But yeah. yeah. So... Then we got at number 14, Hercules. Uh, Bobby Heenan noted that Flair is now the man who's been in there the longest. Uh, Barbarian turned on Flair. Hercules and Bossman are brawling. Hercules came from behind Barbarian. He eliminates him. 
boss man eliminates hercules uh we are on to just flare and boss man i cannot stress enough how boss man moves so well um flying crossbody so now we're down to boss man and flare and then comes in rowdy roddy piper number 15 he also goes right after flare who powders to the outside um so Flair, crowd again even though piper already wrestled earlier in the night won the title they still going absolutely bonkers for him well but again like heenan and monsoon are doing such a good job talking about piper and his story and how he right. won the icy title but that's just like the first notch he's going to go on and he wants to be a world champion right now and they kept playing up his like rough background and everything and if you wanted to do i guess a through line other than the rick flair uh world title win and like defining that Roddy Piper had had a really nice through line, I thought, on this show. Like the story he told from beginning to end, yeah, was really well done. You know? And and you know Heenan too. Heenan did a great job of the baby faces when they'd come in the ring, like making them all seem like a threat. You didn't dismiss anyone. Um, you know, everyone was. You know, when Barbarian comes in, he's like, they keep getting bigger, and uh, this guy's cra you know this guy's crazy, and he just really built up everyone that came in that ring. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it, while also while doing it naturally, to where it didn't seem like, uh, it didn't seem forced. No, no, a hundred percent. And and it did like him and Monsoon are just having a conversation about these guys, right? You know, yeah. and it just happened to be working a lot of this stuff in, and it's nice now because we did see the ring fill up. We've kind of the first wave is over now. We're down to Piper. We're down to Flair. We're Boss Man, and in comes Jake the Snake Roberts, who in this great moment here is Roddy Piper has Ric Flair in the sleeper hole. Jake just comes in. And just so Jake Roberts right. just sits down in the corner and watches. And super, it was so cool. A super cool moment. It was awesome. Yeah, dude. And he eventually got up. He attacked Piper from behind. Um, Flair is knocked out now. Um, and then uh, Flair gets knocked. Uh, oh, no. Jake clothesline Flair. Jake was with DDT Flair. Piper hits him. And again, there was kind of this round robin going on. And then Heenan was praising Piper there when, when Piper kind of saved him from that DDT. And then as soon as Piper started hitting Flair back, he just went off on Piper. Yeah. Well, did. And then on top of that, dude, I'm having a great time. Number 17, Hacksaw Jim Duggan enters the fray here. And dude, of like there were a lot of big pops on the show, right? The Road Warrior pop. It's like it's got its own thing. But Hacksaw Jim Duggan, I think people forget how over hacksaw was this guy like a, another elvis coming into this thing yeah i feel like duggan uh brutus the barber beefcake there's some of these guys that are don't get a lot of respect from fans nowadays but they were big stars during those years like you know from 88 to 93 um I and mean, they were legit big stars and fans would go crazy for them well, and that's the thing, Dave. We had Dave Marquez on here not long ago, and he was like, you know, the, the crazy thing about the business then and now is like back then everybody was millionaires. You know? <laughs> like everybody right. was a millionaire that worked on these shows. Right. And that's not the case anymore. You know? No, no. Yeah, no kidding. So, uh, yeah, I also wrote here Jim Duggan works the exact same style and match uh, he has until he retired a few years ago. I got to work with Jim a lot here on the Indies in the Midwest, and, like, the dude has the same seven-minute match everywhere he goes. He has five moves, and that's all he does. <laughs> so, oh, that's all people want to see. I don't want to see him doing, you know, cradles and small packages. <laughs> it's like I'm watching that. I'm like, I've seen this match a hundred times. Not yeah. that bad. Uh, IRS comes out at number 18. He takes his time getting to the ring. Uh, props to Heenan for saying IRS is calculating his next move. Very simple. Right. Um, then we go to 19, Superfly Jimmy Snuka. The ring is again full. There's a lot of random brawling. Heenan, Heenan keeps talking about all the bumps guys like Flair have taken. And I just thought that was because it's, it's so casual, and I feel like if you were a commentator now and Vince heard you say that, you'd probably lose your job. <laughs> yeah. It's just like an insider. I guess at the time, people didn't know what was insider terms or not, but I don't. Right. I think you would get chastised for talking about how somebody's taking bumps during a wrestling match now. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's a word that was never used. So, um, yeah, it, it stood out. I thought it was, again, it, uh, knowing what I do now, I probably didn't get it back then either. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, then at 20, Undertaker comes out with Paul Bear. Taker quickly eliminates Superfly. Uh, he goes right after uh, Flair goes right after Taker. Uh, Hina noted that's a really stupid move. Um, <laughs> Taker is just choking Flair with one hand, and he does uh, more chokes with. He's not going for choke slams. He's mm -hmm. just one-handed choking people, and he does this a lot in this match. Mm -hmm. I didn't hate it. 
Weird. No, it was cool. I mean, Taker was such a cool character back then. You know, I was talking about how you had a lot of the really gimmicky stuff coming out uh, up, out with IRS and, you know, the other names we mentioned, Repo Man. But Taker was one that was really cool. Like, it really stood out. It And, yeah, you just really felt, once he came out, like, you're really getting the top of the the top of the food chain in this match now yeah for sure and uh then at the at top of the food chain here 21 macho man comes out jake leaves the ring when savage gets in and savage does eventually get his hands on jake and is going nuts savage uh, delivered a top rope double axe handle on jake then eliminated jake roberts and then savage eliminated himself diving over the top rope to get to jake taker then goes outside and threw savage back in the ring with heenan noting that savage wasn't thrown over the top rope so he could get back in the ring. And Monsoon said, well, I'm going to have to check that out. But the ref seemed cool with it. And so Savage was allowed <laughs> to get back into the match. Yeah, so that Savage was- screwed up. Savage screwed up in that part. <laughs> <laughs> so Savage, that wasn't supposed to happen. Like Savage wasn't supposed to go over the top, but he was just so, you know, in the moment that he did that. But they explained it well enough to where sure. I was a huge Savage mark. So I was like, that works for me. <laughs> I didn't mind it. I didn't mind it. I just yeah. thought I had to write out the, the logic there. Uh, yeah, I could have sworn someone had went over the top on their own volition before that. And uh, they were eliminated. It was Andre. Not, not in this year, but before. Uh, it was Andre at, at uh, 80. Was it the original Rumble in 88? No, I don't think Andre was ever in the Royal Rumble. Uh, no, I think he was. He, and Jake Roberts took out the big uh, snake, and then Andre like eliminated himself because he was scared of the snake. Wasn't that a battle royal? It might, but that's why I'm thinking it's the 80. Oh. I'm thinking it's the 88. I think it's the original Rumble because it was like not quite what it was, you know. So I could be wrong. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, that does sound kind of familiar. I mean, because again, I watched that 88 Rumble a lot. <laughs> so like, so it would have been I think it would have been 89 because he was still feuding with Hogan right in 88 88 or something like that but yeah I remember because they had Andre and it may have been, may have been another battle royal but I remember Andre yeah. did get eliminated prior to 92 for sure yeah yeah with yeah Andre the, was done by 92 yeah <laughs> but the Jake the Snake Roberts spot with Andre so okay we can go look up when that was right. <laughs> I'm gonna say Rumble 98 or 88 would be my guess yeah um then we get the berserker i wrote are the berserker and hacksaw jim duggan brothers they look like they could be related <laughs> it's all yeah up here on the berserker yeah well he was supposed to you know he was channeling bruiser brody and then they put the that weird outfit on him it never really clicked yeah, no. and he you know he, he was a big guy i'm surprised they didn't do more with him but oh. his gimmick was just so ridiculous with the sword and you know the 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 crown or whatever he was wearing the viking horns and all that yeah yeah it just kind of took you out right away he'll be a braun Strowman will cosplay as a berserker one year and everyone will be very happy <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome <laughs> um then we get number 23 virgil who went right after irs he uh, i wrote virgil's punches are not the best he has no wind up but he kind of has a he punches like a boxer which is his right. background um and then again i just wrote taker just loves one-handed choking people that's like his thing he's still doing that yeah virgil uh, got an, an, an elimination too you know so i noticed that as well i yeah. mean but again from like and i've spoken with virgil a couple times and some of those times he didn't charge me uh <laughs> he'll tell you he was a big deal and they had big plans for virgil so. it, well they, it's clear that they were i mean that was a long-term storyline that they did with him and dibiase and then him beating dibiase for that million dollar belt i mean it's clear they were trying i mean he'll i think he'll tell you that that was like the biggest money angle they ever had in that period <laughs> I'm sure it was virgil will tell you that's another name i'm putting on the list we're gonna get him this year we're bringing virgil back all right yeah it's been uh, a while uh, number 24, Mustafa, a.k.a. the Iron Sheik, came out with General Adnan and uh, already moving slow here with yeah. the Iron Sheik. Um, I have no notes written here. Between 24 and 25, Rick Martel. Uh, Gorilla Monsoon noted that prior to Flair, Martel had uh, the record for the most time in the Rumble. Uh, Mustafa was then eliminated. I missed by who. Uh, the ring is full, and Hacksaw then just decides to start a USA channel. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Martel, yeah, okay, so it was Virgil that eliminated Hacksaw. Okay, there we go. There we go. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, Rick Martel, you know, great talent, but you could tell that he was kind of winding down here. Like, they were, you know, not, he's kind of not being featured as much uh, this year. 
Yeah, and that's why I say this kind of felt like a culmination because you saw the guys that were stepping up, you know, and we're going to be moving into the picture with The Undertaker and Sean. You saw the guys that were on top with Rick and, and Hulk, who's about to come out here. And then mm-hmm. you saw the guys like Martel or Mustafa that and were kind Kerry of- Carrie Eric. Yeah, yeah. And Ke- yeah, exactly. Tornado. So a real interesting mix here. Yeah. Um, then at 26, yeah, Hogan's music, uh, Hogan comes out, no music. Crowd goes absolutely insane. And this was a night of very big pops all throughout. Mm-hmm. Um, Hulk and Taker engaged in a battle of who can sell punches less. <laughs> um, yeah. No. <laughs> like, no kidding. They were just trying to make each other react. Uh, Virgil eliminated Martel. Hulk eliminated Undertaker with a running clothesline. Uh, then Hulk eliminated the Berserker, ripped his shirt off, and then Hacksaw eliminated Virgil while being dragged over the top himself and was eliminated which brought us to number 27, Skinner. Oh, my God. Good. I think I grew up with a couple Skinners in my neighborhood. Yeah. Hulk, Hulk he Gunner. wrestled Owen at a WrestleMania, didn't he? I uh, Maybe? Yeah, he... I remember him, like, spitting the chew in Owen's eyes, and it went, like, 20 seconds, and then Owen pinned him. Okay. That... What maybe it was WrestleMania 8? Didn't they bring him... Didn't he come, didn't he come back a couple years later? Uh... I don't yeah, like real briefly. I feel like he came back in like 96, 97. I can't remember, but yeah, I remember he had a match with Owen. I just can't remember which WrestleMania it was. Okay. All right. Well, Skinner, yeah. anyway, uh, he came out. Uh, Hulk uh, went to eliminate Flair. It's quite the visual. Uh, seeing those two men again, like in their primes here. Everybody's right. going right after Flair. Um, IRS cut it off. Hulk flung IRS across the room. And I wrote, I can only keep my eyes on Piper and Flair, who are biting and punching each other down in the corner like they absolutely hate each other. Yeah, yeah. And Piper was not selling for Hogan at all. <laughs> no way, man. He wanted Piper wanted to keep Flair to himself down there in that corner. Yeah. Um. Then we got Sergeant Slaughter. Martell eliminated as Bobby Heenan called him the Alligator Man Skinner. Um, yeah. Piper and Hulk go back and forth with eye rakes. Randy Savage using Hulk's torn shirt. Yeah, again, I thought that I was like, where the hell did Randy Savage get Hulk's shirt? He's just running around. He's choking people. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Then then at 29, Sid Justice, who is easily the largest human in this match, and that is really saying something. Um, I said, so many guys are left just wearing. I also noted how everybody was just kind of dressed the same. They're all wearing the short trunks. Nothing really on the trunks except for like Rick's RF. Just different colors. Yeah, let the, yeah, I mean, some of them did, like the IRSs and those guys. But yeah, oh. down at the end with the Piper, Flair, Hogan. Um, yeah, they were mostly just trunks. Yeah, it was just it was like, I don't know, again, like you just wouldn't see that now. Somebody would be yeah. like, hey, do my cape or whatever. I don't know. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. Not many people just wear trunks anymore. Well, that, and like, again, it's like you think Hulk Hogan, Steve Austin, your biggest. John Rock. Cena, Rock. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. John Cena didn't wear you know the shirt but he wore just straight blue shorts you know? right yeah i don't know yeah yeah There's something subliminally to that i'm not sure yeah uh lastly here number 30 the warlord with harvey whippleman sid eliminated slaughter flair escaped outside hulk brought him back in piper eliminated irs simulated sid eliminated warlo- warlor- warlord 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 <laughs> wow man <laughs> i'm watching too much aew yeah there you go <laughs> Martell and Piper are fighting near the ropes. Sid dumps them both over. Justice is trying to eliminate Savage. Flair helps push him over the top. Justice, Hogan, and Flair are all that's left. Sid dumps Hulk. Hulk is stomping. Uh, well, st- Hulk was stomping on Flair. Hulk grabs Sid hand from the outside. Flair dumps Sid to win the Rumble and the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Yeah, you you know when so when Sid dumps Hogan out. The crowd cheers. They go crazy. They're like, uh, yeah. And so they edit WWF edited this for so for like on the main event, like uh, that was like a month later. Uh, they replayed that and then they piped in all these boos when that happened. When on the actual showing and uh, the version on the network is the actual one where the fans were for Sid in this because Hogan, yeah, it, it's every man for himself. Sid was totally justified in throwing Hogan out. Oh, so, totally. Yeah, no, I, I noticed that too. And I was like, you know, and again, it's like you think back to the like politics of Hulk Hogan and stuff. And it's like, how did Hulk feel here? Right. <laughs> that kind of pop, you know? Right. Yeah. And Sid said like Hogan was complaining afterwards to Vince, uh, whining about it. 
uh, and then, yeah, so Flair dumped out Sid and Sid and Hogan when they had that stare down. Uh, Sid was just intense. He was like saying, I'll kill you, which he didn't say back then, like, you know, and on Vince's TV. And he was, I, I got to admit, like going into WrestleMania 8, I think most people thought it was going to be Hogan versus Flair. And then when they did this angle, I was pumped for Hogan and Sid. And, you know, that's the thing that's weird here, right? Because, like, Flair has won the title. He's running up the entrance ramp. Uh, Hulk jumped in the ring. Uh, Mr. Perfect raised Flair's hand on the on the entrance ramp. But Sid came up from behind Hulk, shoved him in the back. A bunch of suits and refs hit the ring. They were trying to pull Hulk and Sid apart. Hulk's hulking up, taunting the crowd. They're going nuts. One of the – and I just wrote, one of the suits looks like they could be Hulk's cousin. But, like, this totally overshadowed Ric Flair's title win which, you know, again, we'll have one more segment here, which is a really iconic promo here from Ric Flair. But for the live crowd, for all intents and purposes, they went home thinking that the big attraction here was Hulk and Sid and not your new world champion, Ric Flair. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and in my opinion, and, and I had been reading Pro Wrestling Illustrated and they always had the match results and I'd been seeing Hogan beating Flair all over the country. So I wasn't as, you know, Knowing that they've already done the match, it just kind of took some of the juice out of it. So yeah, seeing Hogan and Sid, that just man, I was pumped. I was like, why? Why did they do this angle if they're doing Hogan and Flair? Is this to build for after Flair? Um, even though it did seem like Hogan was going to be leaving at WrestleMania, but no, they they uh, they changed their plans up. It was pretty cool. Okay. Um, well, backstage we go to Mean Gene with Flair, Perfect, Heenan, and Tunney. Uh, Tunney presents Flair with the title. Rick says. Uh, that with a tear in his eye, this is the greatest moment of his life, which uh, has become very iconic. Um, he says, you can only stay number one if you are number one. He says, this is the only title in the world that makes you king. You rule the world if you hold this title. Perfect and Heenan woo with Rick. Heenan puts over how Flair competed for more than 60 minutes, and that's why he's the real world champion. Uh, I noted that within six years, everyone involved in this promo, including Gene Okerlund, was working for WCW. <laughs> um, Flair tells the Hogan's, Macho Man's, and Sid's that they can all pay uh, homage to the man. He woos, and he leaves, and thus ends Royal Rumble 92. And it's weird. Like I feel like every show that we've had the chance to review really ends on kind of a cliffhanger of where you know things are going to go. Right. And looking at Rick... In this moment, knowing that Hogan and Sid overshadowed him, knowing where all these guys would wind up in a couple years, just a very interesting mix of dynamics that were going on at Royal Rumble 92. Yeah, I mean, I could, I see your point, but I think to the live crowd, I could definitely see that, the Hogan-Sid thing overshadowing it. But I think to the people watching at home, that promo just put it back all on flair. And, you know, Mean Gene did have a scene steal. <laughs> that, that was a promo where we told the guy to put the cigarette out, right? Like he one did. of the stage hands. Yes, he did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I got it back. Um, I was really curious where they were going. And, uh, you know, Hogan versus Flair made all this, you know, just seem natural. But apparently they had decided well before this rumble that they were going with Hogan and Sid and Flair and Savage. But wow. yeah, it was a uh, man, I- iconic rumble. Rick's too nice. He should have politicked harder. Should have kept that main event spot. So <laughs> he should. I mean, th- that WrestleMania, WrestleMania eight, Hogan and you know Flair and Savage ended with a pin, whereas Hogan and Sid was a DQ. Granted, they had the Warriors return, which was kind of overshadowed that. But um, yeah, I almost think Flair and Flair and Savage should have went last that night. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank you, Raj, for picking a great this and this ends uh, the the five holiday review series here. I'm absolutely up for doing this again next season. I've got to start watching this earlier. What a journey this was, Raj. 20 plus hours on top of my normal week watching all these pay-per-views. But like I've been telling people, man, I think every wrestling fan at the end of each year should pick five or six random pay-per-views. Just go back and watch them because it is just so eye opening from a style perspective, from a character perspective, from a historical perspective, going back and watching the shows compared to where we are today. I mean, there's things I don't like, but I feel at the same time, like there's mm-hmm. lessons to be learned, man. Oh, yeah. uh, there, there's just stuff that works and is more simple back in this kind of era that we right. don't see anymore. Oh, absolutely. And and I try to do that as well, where I, I didn't watch as much WCW in the late 80s um, or when, when it was the NWA. Um, and so I try to go back and watch some of those shows and the same as the early nineties uh, before, you know, I started really watching when uh, the Monday night war started heating up. 
Yeah. But it, it is fun to go back and watch stuff you weren't really that familiar with or uh, and just seeing this, the style and the promos and taking away what stands out to you now, uh, even after all these years. So absolutely. All right, guys. Well, uh, we'll be back on Monday for the return of regularly scheduled dailies for the foreseeable future, five days a week, interviews, punditry. Uh, I encourage you to go check us out on social media at Wrestling Inc. on Twitter, Wrestling Inc. on Facebook, Wrestling Inc. on Instagram. And of course, the Wrestling Inc. YouTube channel, where we put all the interviews up that we do there for uh, a la carte. You can share them around that way. You can check them out. Uh, we also go live with the Wrestling Inc. podcast, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, weekends after pay-per-views. We pulled the audio from that. We put it over on the RSS feed for the Wrestling Inc. podcast. You can check us out in audio form over there on both those podcast feeds. Or again, check us out over on YouTube. Um, Raj, is there anything that you want to uh, plug, promote, put over here to wrap up this New Year's Day edition of the Wrestling Inc. Daily? Uh, no, I just want to thank everyone for just what a, you know, what a crazy year 2020 was and, you know, to continuing to support the site and continuing to visit. It's been a, it's been a wild year. It's been a tough year for so many folks. And uh, hopefully we brought a little levity and, and just some fun to, to fans, you know, that, that visit and we really want to thank, thank each and every one of them. Yeah. A hundred percent. I will piggyback on Raj. 2020 was spoiler alert. Not great. And uh, it has been nice to be able to bring you guys what we can for the world of pro wrestling. I will say that I've maybe had too much time to sit and think about the business, whereas like I was reflecting on how, you know, last year, years before I've been on the road, you know, once a month, you know, every other month kind of or so covering shows, not having to be that hectic and running around everywhere, really just getting to sit and think about the business has been really good and bad. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. Well, yeah. hopefully this next year we can start going to some shows again. That's the goal. Prick yeah. me and get me back on the road, people. That's all Absolutely. I want to do. So, Absolutely. Um, all right, guys. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you on Monday. I'm at House Rebel, H A U S Rebel over on Twitter. Thanks for tuning in. And remember, if you winked, you didn't miss it.